Welcome back to The Glow Life. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe. On today's episode, I am joined by my naturopathic doctor, Dr. Susan Kuchara, who is an absolute wealth of knowledge on all things health, wellness, nutrition, chronic illness, mold, Lyme disease, you name it, she has a remedy for it. On today's episode, instead of talking about chronic illness, which we usually talk about on the show, and even we have an earlier episode with Dr. Susan Kachara where we are talking more about chronic illnesses, but in today's episode, we thought it would be interesting to talk about acute illnesses, things like infections, colds, flus, and what you can do to prevent these little minor ailments, how you can strengthen your immune system. We're going to talk about what you should have in your medicine cabinet. We all are inevitably going to get sick at some point, or maybe someone in your family will. So it's important to have your medicine cabinet stocked with some natural remedies. She's also going to share some interesting techniques that you can use to deal with some of the symptoms of acute illness like fevers or congestion. And I bet you've never heard of at least some of them. I know some of them were new to me, like the magic socks. So I think you'll find this episode really interesting and insightful, and I hope that it helps to keep you well. This episode is brought to you by The Clear Skin Plan, my 90-day program and meal plan to clear your skin from within naturally through dietary and lifestyle changes. Skin issues like acne are not only skin deep. They start deep within with internal inflammation and imbalances. The only way to clear your skin is to address those underlying root causes, and the Clear Skin Plan will help you do just that. With the plan, you'll discover the potential underlying root causes of your breakouts and how to remedy them through dietary and lifestyle changes. You'll also get over 100 delicious skin clearing recipes which you can mix and match or follow the weekly sample meal plans with shopping lists. This program is science-backed, dermatologist approved, and doctor recommended. To get it, head to mariamarlo.com forward slash clear dash skin dash plan. Dr. Susan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be back. So since we're talking about the immune system today, let's just start with this one question that I've been curious about for a while. Why do people respond differently to acute illnesses, colds, flus, Mm -hmm. CV? You know, some people have worse symptoms than others. Some people are completely asymptomatic. So what is the difference, you know, between these two scenarios? Yeah. And I get this question all the time and people say, well, why have people had such intense reactions to acute sicknesses. And when we say acute, we just mean something that's not chronic, right? It's something you're dealing with at this moment that's pretty new. And the first thing I always think of, you know, when people say, when we tell them to eat healthy food and they say, oh, well, my uncle lived till 99 and he had fast food every day and he smoked cigarettes every day. Yet if another person did that, at 40 years old, they may have lung cancer, right? They may have completely different picture. So we have to remember that everybody has a different constitution. Everybody has a you know, different genetic makeup. We're all wired very differently. And you know, as we know, right, before naturopathic medical school, I did IIN just like you did. And we learned that there's bioindividuality. And it's the same thing when we talk about one person's food, right, is another person's poison. And I always talk about it where you know, peanuts could nourish someone and then peanuts could cause an anaphylactic reaction to someone else. So I think that's one big thing we have to remember is we're, we're not like anybody else. With that being said, there are people who have comorbidities, which we call, you know, metabolic diseases. When we think of metabolic diseases, we think of diabetes, we think of hypertension, which is high blood pressure, we think of hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, right? Is, you know, what is your BMI? Is your BMI too high? Is there obesity? What's your lifestyle? Do you live a sedentary lifestyle? Do you have any other chronic health issues, right? So someone who may have an autoimmune disease, right? These things can exacerbate the intensity or duration or, you know, make someone, you know, go to the ER where someone else may have some sniffles, 
so that's two. So constitution, genetic makeup, and then also comorbidities. And then usually another big one that we both talk about is diet. What does their diet look like? Are they eating clean food? Where are they getting most of their food from? Do they cook their own food? Are they going and getting, you know, are they looking at least dirty dozen? Like, are they, you know, avoiding some pesticides, which we know will deplete the immune function, right? Also, are they taking any vitamins every single day? Are they taking basic nutrients? People, you know, would say to me, oh, well, I eat a really clean diet and I don't need vitamins. But it's almost impossible unless you're staying home cooking every meal, every snack and making sure we have, you know, seven to nine (laughs) vegetables and, you know, throughout our day, it could be really hard. So making sure are they taking care of their body every single day, you know, somebody may not be doing that, and they have a worst case scenario. Are they deficient in these vitamins and minerals? So there's a lot of research that had showed that just someone who is vitamin D deficient, has actually had more likelihood to have died, you know, died of a COVID infection than someone not. So looking at nutrient status is really important. And also, lastly, you know, I get a lot of patients who say, oh, my 30 year old cousin was really healthy, and they passed. But being a naturopathic doctor, looking at people's labs, they're not as healthy as they may think, right? So there's like, there's inflammation markers that may come up. There are vitamin deficiencies, right? A lot of people I see are low in zinc. I have patients who come up really high in mercury, right? Heavy metals, which can depress the immune function. So I think that, oh, you're 30 and healthy type of thing is not necessarily true because there might be things going on and they're not having symptoms that they're, they're really inflamed and they're not even knowing that in, in a symptom that may show that, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think that sometimes physical appearance can be very misleading. Like you said, someone can be very fit, they can work out a lot, eat a relatively yep. healthy diet, but we don't really know mm-hmm. what's going on in, under the surface with inflammation. Exactly. And that's that, you know, I talk about acne a lot. And I always say mm-hmm. acne is a blessing in disguise. Because <laughs> it really is. It is, a, it is a surefire sign that you have chronic inflammation. And a lot of people are not as lucky. They don't have that visual alarm bell. And right. then, you know, something terrible happens down the line just unexpectedly. Exactly. Oh, 100%, right? You, you would be wishing for you to have some symptom come out. So you can know how that, it's like the silent killers, right? right. It's like, oh, my acne was a signal, right? Some people just walking around and they have, like I do their labs and their inflammation markers are literally through the roof and they have no idea, right? And we can prevent them from maybe having a heart attack or stroke down the line. Right. So one other point I want to kind of bring up because this is something that I learned from you. Uh, So I've been going to Dr. Susan for many years. And Mm -hmm. um, when I first went to her, you had done my, my lab work. And I think I, I was taking a multivitamin at the time, but you know, you said that, oh, (laughs) this is not the best multivitamin for you based Mm -hmm. on your lab work. I think you need the methylated form of certain vitamins. And when I switched over to that, Oh my goodness. Was it like night and day? Like I actually feel amazing on my multivitamin. I can feel the difference. So you you could feel like what, like, what do you feel? Like energy. I just feel more energy and awake because before I went to you, I was like feeling a little bit tired and like fatigued and uh, basically like low energy. And then after that, it was like, I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel amazing. (laughs) You know? So I remember that. That was, oh my goodness. That was a few years. That was right. That was 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 when we were both in New York. Yeah. That might've been like 2016 or something. Yeah. I remember that too. And I was, I remember being like, oh God, how is she going to take this? Like her vitamins are not like this vitamin is not that good. You know, I, I listen, I don't want people wasting their money and, yeah. you know, throwing out things that are not necessary, unless it's like really bad. I'll tell them just like finish off your vitamin unless it's really you yeah. know, toxic for them and then switch over. Like you said too, because why would you, it's like, if I'm going to pay money for a vitamin, I'd rather the vitamin be doing something than, you know, we call it expensive pee, right? It's like, what are you, you're, you're buying this vitamin and it's literally not absorbing and it's going right through you. So I would love for you to explain, because I feel like you looked at certain markers and you're like, oh, I think that, you know, you, you need the methylated form because you're not absorbing it in the Mm -hmm. standard form. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like a lot of people 
probably aren't even aware that that is a thing. So yeah, like what I looked for, just to yeah. clarify what I looked for in your lab. So I did test you, I believe for, and obviously patient is giving permissions to share uh, <laughs> her, her uh, story. I believe I tested you for MTHFR mutations, A1298C and then C677T. I don't know if you remember those, but I checked you for the MTHFR mutation. Do you remember that? I don't know if you remember it, but it was a certain mutation. 70% of women do have this mutation. It just affects the way that we absorb our vitamins. It also affects how well we detox. And some women, and men have this too, but it just happens to be that 70% of women do have this methylation. It's a genetic mutation and it's not a, you know, not a death sentence. A lot of women hear mutation and they think like, you know, how the scary stuff with breast cancers and is this not something that is really severe in the sense of, you know, you're thinking on that, that, you know, those scary vibes, but you want to make sure that if you are seeing your heterozygous or homozygous, heterozygous usually means that you got it from one parent. Homozygous means you got it from both parents. And there are some doctors who actually specialize. This is like what they do all day. They love this. They do genetic testing all the time. But one thing that it's important to know if you come up homozygous, it means that you're expressing it a lot more that mutation. So if you were to take a vitamin that had, for example, cyanocobalamin, which is a synthetic form of B12, it's derived from cyanide, it's not the best really for you, you're not going to be able, if you have a methylation defect and you do have a homozygous mutation, you're not going to be able to absorb that cyanocobalamin because it's basically your body doesn't have the ability to convert it to the active form if you have that mutation. So that's why we tell people to get like methylcobalamin or methylfolate. So you want to make sure you're getting the methylated forms. And then even if you don't have a homozygous mutation, let's say it's heterozygous, you get it from one parent, you can express that mutation when your body's under stress. So if you are inflamed, which most of Americans are, right? You said you deal with acne patients and I deal with all types of chronic disease patients. You want to say, okay, so if I'm inflamed or if I'm really stressed, right? Most Americans are inflamed and really stressed. I'm probably expressing this mutation more. So I just immediately, because the testing, if insurance doesn't cover, or if, you know, let's say someone doesn't have insurance, it's expensive. I'll just say, you know what? we're going to just go with all of the methylated vitamins. And those are usually the better, you know, vitamin blend anyway, because you know, you're getting all the absorbable forms. Should you have either one of those mutations? Does that make yeah. sense? It's like very, it can be very confusing. I try to do as lame as, uh, as possible, but you know, those are the main takeaways. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and actually now that I'm remembering, I don't now think, I, yeah, no, well, I don't think we actually tested my genes. I think you just looked at my blood work and my situation and you suggested it. And I did really feel a lot better. It might've been, yeah. Cause I don't, I don't have to pull up. I know, it was, it, it was a been, very long time yeah, ago. Long time ago. It might've, so I do normally check the MTHFR on every patient, but if I do check, for example, I think I checked folate on you. And I think I also checked B12. And then there's another marker that you can do besides just serum B12 in your blood. You can do something called MMA, which is methylmalonic acid. And if that is high, it actually means you're low in B12. So it might've been that that came up for you. So you can kind of look through as like a, you know, naturopathic or functional medicine doctor. You can kind of see like, okay, this person probably is not getting enough vitamins and minerals in, or they're not methylating properly or absorbing them. Yeah. It's so, so interesting. Interesting, so right? it's like on the subject of supplements. So for acute illness, one other thing that you taught me is that when you have a cold, a flu, something, some sort of acute illness, your multivitamin is not enough. So why don't we first, before we get into like what to do once you are sick, let's just talk about prevention though. So what should we be doing just for prevention, for keeping our immune system strong? Yeah. What kind of supplements should we be looking at? So patients ask me this all the time. And even, you know, people on Instagram will say, I don't know where to start. You know, I see all these amazing vitamins, all these doctors promoting vitamins. Where do I start? So I got this question so much. I developed a basic supplement starter kit very basic, five items. 
I tell everyone to take every single day for optimal health. So it will have a multivitamin that has the methylated vitamins, the B vitamins in there. It also has 25 milligrams of zinc in there, which is a great amount of zinc to take every day for your immune system and obviously skin and all sorts of hormonal issues. It has 100 milligrams of selenium, which is awesome for uh, immune system antiviral. And then it has other minerals in there. So it's a blend of vitamins, minerals. Then a probiotic. Probiotic, we already know most of our immune system is in our digestive tract, right? We know digestion is going to affect every organ system. So probiotic is also in there. Magnesium. So many, so many people, men and women alike are deficient in magnesium. It's a relaxation mineral, helps with so much bowel function, nervous system, anxiety, depression, muscle pain, sleep everything. Um, and then we have vitamin D we know affects almost 2000 genes in our whole body, immune supportive. People think, Oh, I get a little sun every day. It's very hard to get adequate amounts of sun now, right? A lot of people have sunscreen on, they have makeup on They're depending on their skin tone, depending on where they are, you know, by the equator, right? It's, it's really important to get some vitamin D. And then I usually also do some omegas or like a fish oil, right? So some of my vegan patients, I'll give them like an algae omega, just because it's really important to get those omegas, because if we don't eat them in our diet, and it's hard for some people to get in like wild salmon every day, right? We could tell people to add in chia seeds and hemp seeds, but it's really important because in the omegas, the EPA is really great for inflammation. So we want, that's a great way to quell inflammation. So those are the, my top five. And then of course I say, you know, you can, of course, add in vitamin C, and then we'll talk about all the acute, you know, what to take when you're actually sick. But those are like my five main vitamins, I would say someone should take on a daily basis. And then I could talk about other preventative things. But do you have any questions with that with those? No, those, those make sense. I feel like uh, pretty standard and like omega three, I think some it's something because it's not in a ton of foods, it's basically in seafood and seeds, yeah. which not so everyone eats. It's a, it's definitely a common mm -hmm. deficiency, of course, vitamin D, like you said. So yeah, th this definitely sounds like a solid list to kind of get you to a good baseline. Yeah. Especially you just want to start somewhere. And, and I have to say, patients will say they start, I'll always start people with these five and they can have like six symptoms and four of them can go away within the first month just by getting those foundations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because you're actually giving the body what it needs to do what it's supposed to do on its own, opposed to symptom management with, with vitamins. We don't want to do symptom management, right? We want to do foundations first. And then when we get blood, blood work, or we want to support their hormones, we're going to go more specific. But if you don't have those foundations, I don't see results. If people go straight for the hormones or straight for, you know, if you're going straight for hormones and you didn't even fix your, you know, your gut, you're going to end up not feeling well. So those are my five. And then obviously clean diet, um, adding in lots of like garlic and onions and turmeric, ginger is great, um, bone broth, making sure you're getting in enough colorful fruits and vegetables, as little as possible with, you know, sugar. And I know you are a proponent of sugar, especially for skin. Yeah. And then obviously prevention, basic hygiene, right? Washing our hands. I mean, but we also don't want to become obsessive either because, you know, a lot of people are using these antibacterial, you know, soaps all day and we can affect our actual microbiome and how much good bacteria just by washing all this bacteria off all day. So, you know, obviously you want to use good hygiene, but we don't want to be, you know, washing constantly, constantly, constantly. And then stress management is really important too. finding something to reduce your stress. Cause if we're having cortisol pumping all day, our immune system is going to be in that fighter, you know, that nervous system is going to be fight or flight. And we're never going to have the immune function to attack an invader that's coming in. So those are, I would say in terms of prevention, those are, you know, the diet and the supplements and reducing stress would be my, my top ones. Yeah. All things that we talk about on the podcast all day long, because I think, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, if you want a healthy skin, if you want a healthy gut, if you want healthy, anything, it's kind of the same, eat healthy, get some sunshine, exercise, exactly. don't stress. So let's, you got talk, it. let's talk about now when you do get sick, because it happens inevitably to all of us at some point. What do we do then? Then how are we really fortifying our immune system? So that's a great question. So the first thing you want to make sure is that you have a 
medicinary in your home of the top things to take when you're sick. I get messages, I would say 10 to 20 a week. Oh my God, I have COVID. Oh my God, I have the flu. And then I'm like, well, do you have any stuff in the house I told you to keep? No, where do I get it? Where do I go? But I'm sick. I can't do contagious. I can't go, you know, I can't get to the store. And then, and then, and then they're so frantic that then they're getting themselves sicker because they're so anxious that they don't have. So I always say, keep yourself prepared. So you're not in fear, right? When you're prepared and you know, I have these items at home that are going to help me. You're not going to get as scared, you know, than if you were completely unprepared. So that was another question I got constantly. What should I take for flu? What should I take for COVID? So I did create a COVID plan that's on my website and it has every single item and I can go through the main ones that are on there. But the thing you want to do with natural medicine is go attack it right away. That's why you want to have the items in your house right away, because natural medicine is not a drug. So it's not going to have that instant gratification and it's not going to have the results that you would, for example, if you're going to have, let's just say you're going to take a Tylenol. Yeah. Maybe within an hour, your fever is going to go down. Right. But you need to take them right away to get ahead of it before you, you know, you, a lot of people will say, oh, let me see how I feel tomorrow and I'll take my vitamins. And then they're so sick. And then the natural medicine is not going to work as much as if you took it right away. Mm -hmm. You want to get ahead of it really, really quick. You want to keep it there to be prepared. And you have to remember also, you need to take things in larger amounts when you are sick because your, you know, your body needs those nutrients. And just like you said before with the multi, right? Like 25 milligrams of zinc is great. A hundred micrograms of selenium is great, but when you're sick, your body needs more, right? So that's why we have those individual ones. And then what we do is, and if you want, I can tell you like my main ones, what would yeah. be helpful? Like I can yeah, tell you my main ones that are on my like acute yeah. list that we should have. Yeah. Let's go through some of those. Yeah. So we have first the vitamins, right? So we want to keep zinc at home. I tell people to do at least get like a 30 milligram zinc and ideally like picanolate is really good. Citrate is good. You want to stay away from oxides. Those are salts and they're not absorbed as much. So we want to do the most superior forms. And then usually I have people do at least like 50 to 60 milligrams of zinc, but you want to make sure that you're doing it with food because people get very nauseous when they take zinc without food. So sometimes it can be a little hard because when you're sick, you don't have an appetite and then they're getting nauseous. So I say, break it up and do it with food. So we have zinc. Um, Actually, have, one question yeah. on zinc. So with yeah. zinc, um, I know that high doses of zinc can deplete copper. And I know sometimes mm-hmm. a lot of zinc supplements will also have copper in them yeah. for that very reason. Mm-hmm. But if you're in a, a situation where, yeah, I guess you're only going to be taking it for a short time because you're, you know, it's a cold or flu or something like that. Does it matter as much? Or would you say like also ensure that you have some copper? It does not matter, especially acutely. So we used to ask this question in medical school all the time. And my mentor told me specifically, if you're worried about depleting copper, it's usually with long-term use of high zinc. So I just had this conversation with a patient yesterday. Zinc is helping her acne at 60 milligrams, but she's been doing it for about three months. So that's when I said, okay, we should add in probably one to two milligrams of copper, right? But so if you're in an acute illness, you have COVID, cold, or flu, you don't need to take copper. I mean, if you did, it's okay, yeah. but you don't need to take it a copper. You can go straight with the zinc. And then it's helpful to do zinc and quercetin at the same time because it helps the, the quercetin helps drive the zinc in. So you can do those at the same time quercetin, you know, people can go up to, and as always, this is not medical advice, you know, you're not, you know, if you're not my patient, but people can go up as high as, you know, sometimes we're going up to 1500. Um, they could do, you know, a few caps a day. Again, I tell them to spread it out throughout the day. Cause also when you're sick, you don't, it's like hard to swallow so many right things without feeling kind of queasy. And then we have obviously vitamin D. I do tell patients to do at least 10,000 when they're sick. And then when they're kind of on the tail end of it, and then they're starting to feel hundred percent, I'll even have them do a few days more than that at that, at that amount. Obviously, if you're under the supervision of a doctor, they might even go to extreme high amounts. So some doctors will go with COVID. They'll even go up to like 50 to a hundred thousand, but do not do that unless you're being supervised by a doctor. 
And then we have vitamin C, right? Uh, if you don't have a risk of kidney stones, that's another one. You can go super high or you can do it to bowel tolerance, right? The most that will happen is you'll just have loose stools. So we want to um, be safe. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C. With vitamin C, do you have a favorite form? Because I know there's different forms of that, like liposomal vitamin C. So there's, yeah. See, liposomal is highly absorbable. However, like when I, when I was sick, I didn't have it in my house. I had ascorbic acid. I mean, I've been using that for how long, right? So you know, if you have stomach issues, you can do a buffered vitamin C, which is ascorbic acid. And then it just has some calcium and magnet to buffer the ascorbic acid, but you can use whatever you have. If you have liposomal, that's awesome. It's really, really highly absorbable. But if all you have is regular ascorbic acid, that's okay too. Just make sure if you have any type of stomach issues, you just do it with food or take a little cow mag around it or, or a blend that has some cow mag in it. Yeah makes sense with C. And then um, what else? So we talked about the vitamin I'm trying to think, oh, vitamin A is another one. Um, vitamin A as well. Like if someone's not my patient, I just say stick around, you know, 10 to 20,000 IU a day. Obviously you can go much higher if you're under supervision. You do not want to take more than 5,000 IU of A if you're pregnant or wanting to become pregnant. And um you don't want to take more than 5,000 IU if you're pregnant or want to become pregnant to so be careful of that. So those are like the main ones. And then there's NAC. NAC is a great one. That's yeah, cysteine. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit, because I feel like this is one that we're hearing a lot about more now, uh, but that I, I would assume a lot of people are not really familiar with. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of NAC? Yeah. So NAC is N-acetylcysteine. People call it NAC. People call it NAC. And what this is, is a precursor to glutathione. And glutathione is our body's main antioxidant, main detoxer. And why it's so important is it helps dry up mucus. It's a, it's a mucolytic. So it helps to dry out mucus and especially good for COVID, right? Because a lot of people are having mucus and right sinuses, they're having, they're constantly spitting up congestion. It's great for upper respiratory infections. Uh, it's great for your immune system. And then on a bonus side, it does help detox your liver and it's great for fertility. It's great for hormones. So there's a bunch of other nice aspects of it. People always ask me, do I need to take glutathione and NAC together? I don't think you need to do that because NAC is a precursor. So if you're already sick and you want to dry up mucus, just take the NAC. If you have glutathione at home and you want to take it too, you can. But a lot of patients are sensitive and that might be really detoxing for them. So I'd say just like tread lightly there. And you don't mm -hmm. also want to spend a lot of money on having to take both, right? So you can kind of do one or the other, but I personally, in my kit, I have NAC over, over glutathione because I'm trying to help the mucus and the immune system at the same time. And the, the liposomal glutathione is not so good in the mucus department. So we kind of need that. Got it. And, and glutathione, liposomal glutathione is pretty expensive as well. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. It's like 40 to 60 bucks for a bottle yeah. and not everyone can afford that. But like NAC, you can get a bottle for like under 30 bucks and you get like 60 capsules or something. And that's a precursor. So, you know, the other thing, you just don't want to take NAC long term because you can dry yourself out too much. And there was even a doctor, I don't know if you know of Dr. Ben Lynch, he was even talking about on his, on his Instagram once that he noticed because he was taking it for so long, like he was getting nosebleeds because it was just drying him so much. So again, oh, wow. if you're on NAC for a year, like you think, and you're, you know, and he even said it was causing some like, um, like an odor with urine. It's like almost like it was just drying out things. It was detoxing a little too much. So just don't do it long term. Do it more like acute, maybe not more than like a few months at a time. Yeah. And I like this that we're making this distinction because um yeah, sometimes you can think, oh, a little bit is good. Why not <laughs> have more? <laughs> more more is not always better. Yes. And so 100%. Yeah, these, these even higher doses and these specific things we're talking about now is for when you're acutely sick to help you get back to your exactly. baseline. Okay. Exactly. exactly. So NAC, anything else that? Uh... Um, yeah, and then I usually, obviously, um, I always like to, I always like to add 
if they're not taking selenium already, like if they're, you know, if they're, if their multi doesn't have it or whatever, selenium is another immune support. Um, and then if they're worried about blood clots, um, you know, because COVID, we, you know, some people worry about the clotting perspective of it. Um, there's an adokinase, which basically can break up those fibrin that could be developed anytime someone's having COVID. And obviously not everyone's going to have that, but as a prevention to calm you, you know, calm your nerves, yeah. like, okay, I'm taking something uh, preventatively. And then um, just the last thing that's really important uh, is you want to make sure that you're doing some antimicrobial too. I think that helps to shorten the duration. Like the vitamins are great, but if you can do like a combo golden seal echinacea or it's your colloidal silver or it's um, oregano oil, right? So you want to kind of add in some type of antimicrobial that would act almost as if you are antibiotic, right? It's obviously nothing is the exact same as an antibiotic, but it's a natural antimicrobial. And is there such a thing as too many antimicrobials in the sense that is just taking one, one or two of these enough, or, you know, can we take, if we're taking five of them, are we like, you know, a little over the overkill? So it depends. So personally, I took everything I had, right. Because I was like, you know, I wanted to make sure I was okay. And I was going to get my fever to, you know, get that, you know, reduce yeah. and, you know, the aches and pains, but again, know yourself. If you're sensitive, don't be doing like, for example, if you have golden seal echinacea at home and I tell you do two dropperfuls three times a day, which is normally what's a good amount, right? Because again, with herbs, you have to do high dose herbs if you want them to actually work. But then you also have oregano and you also have colloidal, maybe not do the max of every single one, right? A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, just because it's just like you said before, too much can be overwhelming too. So, you know, it's totally fine to kind of mix antimicrobials together, but just don't, don't get yourself to the point where it's so much that you're potentially now getting sick because you're <laughs> taking too much of the acute ones. You know what I mean? Right, right. Exactly. So something interesting that you also introduced me to was magic socks, <laughs> which I also feel like it, well, probably a lot of people have no idea what those are. So can you explain their purpose and... How to yeah. Do that. yeah, of course. So we call them magic socks. And we always say this because if we, if we called it wet socks, no one would do it immediately. So we say they're magic because they do, they are magical. So the whole concept of magic socks is you basically wet your cotton socks before bedtime with cool water. So some people can just, you could put a little bolt. You can either just go right under the, with the cotton socks into the faucet of cool water or you could just do a bowl with some ice cubes in it and dip them in and you put on the, and then you wring out really, really, really well. And you, you don't want them dripping or you do not want them so wet because you're not going to be able to warm them throughout the night. So you're putting on wet socks with then wool socks over before bed to wake up in the morning with dry socks. And you're like, what the heck is the point of doing that? So what it does is it helps to move blood and lymph. Your whole circulatory system gets moved. Also, it helps to bring down all the mucus out of the head, neck, respiratory, right? In your lungs. And then also what happens when your feet have to, when your feet are wet, your body says, oh my God, my feet are wet. I have to warm up because my feet shouldn't be wet, right? So in order to warm up, what you're gonna have to have happen is your body's gonna in increase its internal temperature. And so when you increase that internal, te internal temperature, it's the same thing as when we get a fever, right? The whole great, the, you know, the great thing about a fever is it's killing off what's not supposed to be there. And that's why it's not the best to give a fever reducer when you have a fever, right? Unless there's caution groups, of course, of course. But the whole concept is it's supposed to heat up everything. So it kills up, you know, kills off what's not supposed to be there. So the one thing you want to make sure before you do the socks is you want to make sure your body's kind of warmed up, right? You don't want to be shivering to death and then put on cold socks. So maybe a cup of hot tea. You can do, you know, if you want to take a bath, hot bath, if you want to take a shower, or even just, you know, sitting on the end of the um, tub and just putting your feet in hot water just to warm up your body a bit. And then you do the socks. So it's it's basically cotton socks, thin ones, wring it out really well after you do the cool water. 
put them on and then you're putting on two pair of really heavy socks on top, but ideally wool socks. I asked my patient in, in Arizona the other day if she had wool socks. She was like, uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't. So you just use whatever, you know, hot socks you have, but wool just keeps the heat in. So that's the whole concept of keeping the, the wool. And then you wake up and a lot of, I get so many testimonials that people are like, oh my God, I feel so much better. But if you don't feel better the next day, it doesn't mean it didn't work. You just keep doing it during the duration of your sickness. And how did you like, so tell me your experience with, yeah, <laughs> with so doing I it. use them and I hate the cold. Well, actually, no, <laughs> I, I have to rephrase that. I used to hate the cold. I feel like I actually like it now, but the mm-hmm. idea of putting cold wet socks on is obviously not appealing <laughs> at all. <laughs> It, so it's it's a little bit weird at first, but I mean, you wake up, the socks are dry in the morning and yeah, I mean, I don't know if I felt anything in particular. I can't even remember now, but I, I think I you told me you slept better. I, yes, I think. Yes, you're right. I remember it like texting you yeah. or, or emailing you. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I, I definitely slept better. I'm yeah, you said now. you had a really good night's sleep and I said, yeah, because it puts you into parasympathetic because in that moment yes you remember so calm yes that was (laughs) yes I was so so calm actually isn't that awesome yeah (laughs) so it's very strange but very cool (laughs) very cool I love it it's great for kids too because who have fevers especially Uh you want to you know you can you anyone can use it but of course the colder it is the more intense the treatment so you you know for little ones or anyone's older you want to just make sure you're not doing freezing freezing cold socks Right. And it's always good. Like, like having you as a naturopath, like, even though I kind of know some of the things now, like I've all learned things from you and, you know, yeah, I still, course. I still like talking to you. Like if I'm, <laughs> if I'm acutely sick, uh, you know, I, I want to talk to you because I don't want to do it alone and I want the guidance and, and all of that. So I think it is important to have Absolutely. A, a naturopath and I do the same thing. You think when I'm sick, I don't talk to my (laughs) naturopath. Oh my God. I forget everything I know. Like I know stuff too, just like, you know, stuff, right. I mean, you know, a ton of stuff. And when you're sick, you forget everything that you're supposed to do. And also it's like the comfort. You just want someone to tell you, yes, yes. Do it. Even though, you know, it's just that comfort that you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be okay. You know, Or, or even just like, for example, like just if someone gives you specific symptoms about their illness, so like we have acute like sick care visits, right? So if they tell me a few symptoms and I'm like, oh, that sounds like that homeopathic remedy, they can go get some boron remedy and it can, it, you know, make the healing go so much faster too, right? So, you know, you, when you're talking to someone, it's only comfort, but you can also get a little bit more specifics for your, exactly. you know, your, your sickness. Exactly. For more from Dr. Susan, you can head over to her website, naturallysue.com, which I'll link to in the show notes.